Dr. Patricia Jones, the Medical Director of Laboratories at Children's Medical Center in Dallas and a Professor of Pathology at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center. I also happen to be the Chair of the Policy and External Affairs Core Committee at AACC, which is a global scientific and medical professional organization dedicated to achieving better health through laboratory medicine. AACC's members are professionals who work in clinical laboratories, medical institutes, and in vitro diagnostic companies. But you probably know us best as the people who are currently on the front lines of COVID testing. We are excited to talk to you today about a special category of clinical laboratory tests known as laboratory developed tests and about why these tests have been so important for diagnosing COVID-19 and managing the pandemic overall. As you all know, clinical laboratory testing has played an indispensable role in efforts to limit COVID-19 transmission and to bring this pandemic under control. Prompt, accurate COVID-19 testing is essential to identifying people who have contracted the virus and who need to self-isolate especially those who are pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic. In particular, laboratory developed tests, which are non-commercial tests that labs create and use internally, are a critical part of the healthcare system's COVID-19 toolbox. When the pandemic first began, there were almost no commercial COVID-19 tests available on the market. So it was CMS certified labs that developed, validated, and performed laboratory developed tests for COVID-19, enabling patients to access testing for the virus much faster than would have been possible if healthcare institutes had had to wait for commercial COVID-19 tests to become available. The labs performing these LDTs have to meet stringent regulatory requirements under CMS and CLIA, which stands for the Clinical Laboratory Improvement Amendments. In spite of this, over the last several years, FDA has tried to make the case that it should regulate laboratory developed tests in addition to CMS regulation. Additional FDA regulation of laboratory developed tests, however, would stymie the ability of labs to respond quickly to new conditions, such as COVID-19. Not only because this regulation would be duplicative, but also because FDA's regulatory process is designed for diagnostic manufacturers that sell commercial tests and that have far greater resources than clinical laboratories. Thankfully, the Department of Health and Human Services recently declared that FDA does not have the authority to regulate laboratory developed tests without formal notice and comment rulemaking, a decision that AACC has welcomed. In the wake of this decision from HHS, our goal now is to continue to raise awareness about the vital importance of laboratory developed tests and about the nuances of how these tests are regulated so that any future changes in healthcare policy and regulation will still ensure patients have access to these critical tests. Now I'd like to introduce Dr. Dennis Dietzen. Dr. Dietzen is the Medical Director of Laboratories at St. Louis Children's Hospital and a Professor of Pathology, Immunology, and Pediatrics at Washington University School of Medicine. Dr. Dietzen will explain in greater detail everything you need to know to fully understand laboratory developed tests and the unique patient and public health needs that these tests are designed to meet. Dr. Dietzen. Uh, thank you, Patty. Uh, for the next few minutes, I'm gonna run you through uh, an overview of laboratory developed tests. I'm gonna talk to you about what are LDTs, who develops LDTs, where are they performed and what conditions really rely upon laboratory developed tests for the best patient care. The best analogy I can think of uh, for, for describing LDTs is cooking. Um, an LDT can be thought of as cooking from scratch, cutting up the raw ingredients, getting the skillet out and getting everything ready for dinner. 
we do a lot of other tests in the laboratory that don't involve that degree of, of, of scratch cooking, for example. Uh, we call those moderate complexity tests. And the best analogy for that I have is, is a box of hamburger helper. You know, most of the ingredients are there. We have to do a little bit of prep before they're ready to go, but they're not too difficult to put into service. And then there's another uh, level of, of simplicity called usually reserved for things called point of care testing, which I liken to pulling up to a drive through window where everything is ready to go and you can pick up your dinner on the way home. An example of that test may be the glucometer that diabetics use for blood glucose measurement. So keep in mind that example of cooking from scratch for the next uh, few minutes as I describe LDTs. What's an LDT? An LDT is much more than what happens in a test tube. Uh, an LDT starts with sample acquisition. Uh, I'll use COVID testing as an example of the sample collection process. There are a number of ways to get a sample in nasal pharyngeal swabs. There are oral swabs and most recently saliva is being used as a testing modality for COVID as well. Once we have that sample, we have to purify the target that we want to measure. And then once we purify that target, COVID testing involves a process called PCR where we amplify that target. But then we have to make sure that the target we amplify is the right target. So there are a number of steps from sample collection through purification, through target amplification and analysis that allow us to do this test. Once we build it, we have to make sure that we know, we know it works. And there are a series of tests that we must do to characterize that test. How precise is that test? If we do that test over and over and over again on the same sample, on the same patient, is it going to give us the same answer every time we do it? It, it has to do that. Uh, is it accurate? Do we always identify the right piece of DNA in, in a COVID test to be able to detect uh, the infection? Uh, what's the reportable range? What's the reference range? Reference ranges are those those values that are associated with, with healthy populations. We must understand what this looks like in a healthy population if we're gonna make a diagnosis in a non-healthy population. And then we have to make sure we know how the, the as I described, you know, sample collection is not always simple and perfect. Uh, if we get a suboptimal sample, what does that do to the process? So all of this ties into how accurate does this test, uh, how accurate is this test in the population in which we wanna test it? So who develops these LDTs? Typically the folks involved in building these have a bachelor's degree, usually in a science, but not always. The builders of LDTs sometimes go on to get medical degrees and others go on to get PhDs, but that's not enough. After an advanced degree, there's further training. MDs usually go through what's called a residency, usually in clinical pathology or anatomic pathology. And PhDs go through a two to three year fellowship program where they learn how laboratories operate, what the regulatory structure of laboratories is, and how to build LDTs. And even that's not enough. After we do that, there are a number of criteria that we must meet for board certification, including passing usually a written exam, sometimes an oral exam. And then even that's not enough. Periodically throughout our careers, uh, we must provide documentation of our, our continuing education and other things to maintain our certification at periodic frequencies throughout our career. Where do LDTs happen? LDTs are usually not performed nationwide, worldwide. LDTs are usually developed for smaller patient populations in a single geographic location. This is my medical center. This is where a lot of LDTs get done. This happens to be a rather large medical center with a number of laboratories. But the patient populations that we test all come here for their care. and These are where the tests are performed. Why do we build these things? What conditions force us to build LDTs? Some tests have been around for decades. Uh, and some tests become obsolete, they become outdated. Laboratorians are trained to recognize when that happens and we get rid of those tests and we replace them, sometimes with other tests, sometimes with LDTs. Another prime example of the use of LDTs is in rare conditions. Uh, I work in the field of inborn errors of metabolism in little babies and small children. These are very rare conditions and commercial entities often don't make investments in these small patient populations but they still need tests. And uh, laboratorians, we build these tests and we provide that patient care that is so necessary for those babies to develop normally. Uh, a lot of times tests that we, the rare tests that we have to refer off campus take too long to come back to impact patient care. So under those circumstances, we might decide to build something ourselves so that we can provide it faster. 
In addition, there are new diseases that are characterized at a very rapid clip these days. There are new infections that arise. The, the perfect example, of course, is SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19. Uh, there are, when we learn more about the pathophysiology disease, we understand that we may be able to detect new markers of that disease. So we might build a test for that new marker, or we may have a new technologic toy that we can deploy to detect that new disease. And we will do that if it leads to better characterization of disease and more rapid characterization of disease. So all of these are practiced in the context of, of a patient. Um, many times laboratory tests are not standalone diagnosis tools. They contribute to a patient's diagnosis that includes a family history, a social history, a physical history. LDTs can be deployed in many of those situations. So here's, a, here's an example of a kind of a timeline of how LDTs played out in the COVID pandemic. The first tests that came into the fray in the pandemic were built by the World Health Organization and the Centers for Disease Control. Those were distributed to public health labs. Those tests had a couple of issues. Number one, they, they took a very long time uh, to result. Uh, in our situation, the Missouri Department of Public Health was turning those around in seven to 10 days. Uh, as you might imagine, that's not really good enough to identify carriers of the infection and isolate them and make sure that they don't spread it any further. Uh, in, in addition to the long turnaround time, there was some contamination in the first few kits uh, that were deployed and that led to equivocal test results. So very soon after this situation started to play out, laboratorians all over the country began to design and build their own LDTs for this infection. And those LDTs became the sole eyeballs that laboratories and public health officials had on the evolution of the pandemic uh, uh, throughout uh, January, February, and March, uh, when the scope of the problem became very, very clear. Uh, but building an LDT like this posed many problems. The supply lines were fragile. Everybody wanted the same stuff. So we were all competing for the same reagents. The regulatory environment was also challenging. Uh, the FDA typically does not have much jurisdiction over LDTs, but the FDA asserted some authority here. Uh, so that complicated, uh, that complicated the characterization of the tests because uh, we characterize them according to our usual, uh, according to our usual procedures. But then we, have, we had to make sure that the FDA was okay with what we're doing as well. And what we ended up with was actually not a single LDT. Uh, on our campus, we ended up with multiple LDTs, depending on the supplies that we could get with multiple sample modes, depending, you know, the supplies had to be matched to the sample mode. And we had m multiple supply lines that we had to take care of. And some of those were, were flush with reagents and others were not. And we had to adapt on, on almost a daily basis to make sure that we were testing, uh, that we had enough test capacity to make sure we could keep our eyes on the development of the pandemic. So the best example of LDTs that I can leave for you is that LDTs are a bridge. Clinicians are tasked with making patient care decisions on a daily basis and to make sure that that patient is correctly diagnosed and correctly treated. And that bridge between the laboratory and helping the physician is the key role that laboratory developed tests play. And without those LDTs, patient care is not optimal. It's not personalized. In the end, patients end up suffering unnecessarily without LDTs. This is the place where laboratorians thrive. We thrive in that area where we're innovating. When we know about the disease state, we know what the clinicians need and we know how to build these things. That's where we innovate the best. Innovation is counterbalanced by regulation, of course. We're not doing these things in an unregulated environment. But there are a number of agency regulations that we must also follow. The primary set of regulations are those from CMS through the Clinical Laboratory Improvement Amendments. What we must characterize in an LDT is stipulated very clearly. We have to validate that method and make sure that it's measuring what we think it's measuring. We have to make sure that it's diagnosing the disease we think it's diagnosing. We have to make sure that quality control is adequate to make sure that that test is being done accurately every day that it's in use. And again, you know, this, these are not static sort of tests either. We, they, they evolve. As we learn more about the test, as we learn more about the sample, as we learn more about the disease, we may modify that test to improve it that's actually helpful for the patient. Above the CLIAlules, there's other regulatory bodies that are also involved. Our laboratory, for example, is also certified by the College of American Pathologists. They tend to inspect our documentation related to these tests. They come on site 
to make sure that we are doing what we say we are doing with those tests. And that's how compliance with all of these regulations is assured. Other states uh, have some of their own regulatory bodies like the New York State Department of Health, but typically the FDA has not historically been involved in regulating any of these tests. So uh, FDA regulation would be another layer of regulation uh, that may actually be counterproductive with the current set of regulations that we use. So again, I'll just close then highlighting the role of the chef in building these tests the chef knows all of the ingredients that are necessary. When you make a mistake, the chef knows it. And again, at the end of the day, the laboratory developed tests are a key component for taking care of, of many different forms of patients, whether it be a new disease like COVID or a rare disease like inborn errors of metabolism. So uh, I will leave you with that and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Dietzen, for giving us that background on why laboratory developed tests are so integral to modern healthcare. I would now like to introduce Dr. Carolee Estelle, who will elaborate on how laboratory developed tests have improved the U.S. response to COVID-19 specifically. Dr. Estelle is Interim Chief of Healthcare Epidemiology at Parkland Health and Hospital System in Dallas and Assistant Professor of Medicine in the Division of Infectious Diseases and Geographic Medicine at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center. Dr. Estelle. Thank you, Patty. I have the honor of helping lead the COVID-19 pandemic response for Parkland Health and Hospital System, which is the county safety net hospital for Dallas County in Texas. Parkland is an 878 bed hospital with the busiest emergency department in the United States and provides more than a million outpatient visits per year. During this pandemic, our teams have diagnosed and cared for a large proportion of the COVID patients in Dallas County. I'll use our experience during this time to give you a picture of the far reaching impact testing can have in mitigating the spread of infectious diseases. The most obvious benefit is an accurate rapid test that allows providers to begin appropriate supportive measures as early as possible. And what's been well publicized is the utility to identify cases for isolation and tracing in the community. But rapid testing also impacts hospital operations and PPE supplies, which have all been under critical threat during this pandemic. In the community, rapid testing allows for the identification of cases so that we may trace their contacts and isolate both the cases and the exposed individuals. When testing availability is low and turnaround times are long, their utility in containment and mitigation are severely diminished and it slows down our ability to identify, trace, and isolate. Within the hospital, Rapid identification of cases help us prevent the spread of infection, conserve precious PPE, and know where we can care for these patients, where their care should be delivered within the hospital system. Limitations in availability can lead to the spread of disease throughout the hospital and community if these cases are not identified. When a patient is suspected to have COVID-19, we initiate what we call COVID precautions, where we instruct our providers to care for the patient using CDC recommended personal protective equipment. In the setting of critical PPE shortages, it can be wasteful when hours and even days pass using scarce PPE on a patient that does not in fact have COVID-19. And while we do this because it is better to be safe and protect our teams, rapid, reliable testing can decrease some of this waste. Per CDC recommendations, COVID-19 patients should be cared for under negative air pressure conditions, as well as have dedicated care providers if able. To fulfill these recommendations, the COVID-19 status is needed in order to know which unit or place in the hospital that they should go. When turnaround times are long, patients get bottlenecked in the emergency department where they're waiting for a test to result to tell us where to place them. This can impact not only the access of care 
for our COVID patients, but also the access of care for all patients presenting to the emergency department. For our healthcare workers, it's important that we have rapid testing to quickly and confidently identify which patients that they need to use the PPE to protect themselves. It also allows us to more appropriately risk stratify the timing of procedures such as surgeries and other aerosol generating procedures that can be much more risky to our healthcare workers. The pandemic has also caused critical staffing shortages that can easily cripple hospitals' ability to deliver care in its community. The availability of rapid testing of employees to determine if they have developed disease or can return to work can help preserve this critical workforce. At the patient level, the delay in diagnosis that results from tests not being readily available and turnaround times being long delays the initiation of treatment that requires diagnostic confirmation and can ultimately lead to exclusion from drug studies because of diagnostic timing requirements for these trials. As some of the treatment trials have timing stipulations and if the results take too long, it can lead to the patient being excluded altogether. And if this is occurring at a large enough scale, this could even hamper the scientific community's ability to study new treatments that we need so badly. Before the availability of COVID-19 laboratory developed tests and each time that that availability is threatened through supply chain shortages, it can lead to rationing of tests, delays in patient care and increased use of precious PPE resources. For any number of different infectious diseases, the ability to have testing that is quick and accurate allows us to make accurate diagnoses, isolate and trace cases as necessary, optimize the utilization of PPE, and create protocols that streamline our operations. For today, the discussion was around COVID-19, but these principles apply to all of the communicable diseases that we manage in our healthcare systems today. Thank you so much for your time and consideration. Thank you, Dr. Estelle. It's great to hear how laboratory developed tests have not only enabled rapid COVID-19 diagnosis, but have also helped hospitals manage the increased demand for services that have come with the pandemic. That's everything we have for you today. If you would like more information about how Congress can help ensure patients continue to benefit from laboratory developed tests, I encourage you to read AACC's position statement on this topic. This can be found at our website, aacc.org. Also, please do not hesitate to send any questions you have to Vince Stein, AACC's Senior Director of Government and Global Affairs at the email address that you see on your screen. And thank you for taking the time to join us.